Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. Welcome back to another episode of our intermediate series and today we're going to be revisiting a species that we've covered previously. Ashley who works with us, Paulson, has been nagging us for the past few weeks to try and uh, recover this because the previous uh, video had incredibly poor sound. Uh, we've subsequently kept and bred the species for another three years. It's given us a greater level of insight and it's probably going to be useful to recover it with the same depth that we have been doing with our other more recent episodes over time of course we'll revisit other stuff as we get them and uh, improve uh, the videos that we once put out so we'll sort of uh, recycle and reuse and improve so uh, this is the false water cobra aka the brazilian smooth snake whose scientific name is hydrodynastes gigas hydro water dynasties prince gigas giant the giant water prince roughly translated. First described by Dumeril Bibron and Dumeril in 1854 as Xenodon Gigas. Uh, Xenodon uh, means roughly strange tooth, Xeno strange, Odon teeth, uh, and Gigas obviously giant, so the giant strange tooth snake. This is in reference to a pair of enlarged rear fangs, um, similar to a lot of things that we'll see like whether the hog noses or, or uh, the baron's races where you know there are uh, mild venoms devoinies gland which develops a special um saliva that helps to um in incapacitate the prey that they take now um the genus hydrodynasties was first used in 1966 by hodge the species has then bounced between two genera, Cyclograss and Hydrodynasties, but has remained in Hydrodynasties since 1999, so it's pretty pretty sure that we're, we're going to be staying in Hydrodynasties for the time being. Hydrodynasties traditionally was part of the Xenodontidae, harking back to the Xenodontid reference a minute ago, as the Xenodon reference given a moment ago. Um, meaning the strange tooth and this then makes it a cousin of the mock vipers and this of course is a mock or false cobra xenodon merimai which occurs in similar conditions and then there is the pseudo xenodons which look very similar almost convergent evolution but they are asian or chinese so that it, it, it all sort of ties in now Xenodontidae has been made uh, synonymous with Dysapsidae, um, but for the purposes of this video and the little segue that we can have to um, Xenodon, I'll use Xenodontidae as my descriptive term rather than Dysapsidae. Um, there are three recognised species of Hydrodynasties. Hydrodynasties by Cinctus, which is Herman's water snake, which can be seen here, and that has a type locality of Para in Brazil namely Belém, and then up into French Guiana and Suriname. And then there is a newly described species called Hydrodynasties Melanogigas, which is uh, the black false water cobra, which occurs in, what is it? Toc Let me pronounce it right. Ah, Tocantins, Brazil, which is here. Now, there is registered... Um, ...records where... The false water cobra has occurred throughout all of this region. But when I was looking at the, the density of uh, animals found, they occurred mainly in this region. And it does tie in, if they're from this region, with the way that we keep them in captivity. So more than likely our animals are from this region. As you can imagine, that is quite a span. <laughs> and from Belém down to the type locality of the false water cobra Hydrodynastes gigas which is the third species is Corrientes in Argentina that is a distance uh, by road of 4,000 kilometers or just under that's a hell of a long way and because of this huge changes in the way that the climate behaves locally for these snakes is to be expected using recorded sightings uh, of these snakes the vast majority of records come uh, for Hydrodynastes gigas occurred from the south to the south from central and eastern Bolivia here and then the majority of Paraguay northeastern Argentina and then a belt across southern central Brazil but not the extreme south of Brazil or Uruguay 
So uh, from this section, we've then picked four locations to see what happens annually to local climates in macro view. This, of course, is not the local microclimate, but it will help inform us in some way of what the animals face. But we'll cover this, as always, at the end of the video. False water cobras are semi-aquatic snakes which specialise in hunting amphibians and fish, but they will also take mammals, birds, and other reptiles, including snakes. They're adept swimmers and, and they're very good climbers as well. And they also have a very clever trick which they do with their tail, which I watched a video of actually a few weeks back, maybe a couple of months back, where um, they whip their tail into the long grass and reeds, which startles and scares and spooks the animals hiding in there out. And then they trap them. It's an incredible use. And it's like we see caudal luring in things like green tree pythons, but this isn't caudal luring. This is like caudal whipping to be able to scare animals out and then feast upon them which is an incredibly cool and innovative technique to, for this snake to use facially there are certain features particularly with youngsters that hark back to the tamnophis which is the garter snakes and ribbon snakes nerodia which is the american water snakes and natrix which is the uh, grass snakes and dice snakes of europe uh, so and they belong to the natricini and there are some parallels there but the similarities do end there the natricine snakes are mildly to heavily keeled almost universally and each of the scales will have a central ridge down it giving them quite a rough complexion to feel whereas this snake is glossy and smooth and it just feels wonderful to hold it's just like a giant silk sausage just absolutely awesome aren't you beautiful She's just, honestly, these snakes are ace. They're so cool. But this is a big snake. There are claimed sizes of up to 10 feet. More usually, a size of 7 to 8 feet is commonplace. Because these animals are such great feeders, obesity is a real concern. We feed our animals quite modestly here. And our adult female, who's approaching 9 years old, is still only just barely seven feet in length and usually her egg yields are anything from 10 to 15 eggs and she will sometimes double clutch throughout a season we had three animals come in the other week which we sexed uh, and they were enormous absolutely monstrous things all approaching nine feet in length when i asked the owner how old they were he said they just turned four so you can only imagine the amount of food that must have been ram down these snakes necks to get them to these distended obese size there is nothing clever or good about having monstrous false water cobras our female is tame in fact she's so tame that when we did the pointers to look for on a healthy snake it was the female false water cobra that we used because she is so relaxed around humans and is happy to have people looking in her eyes and opening her mouth and which is all the stuff i did when i was doing the confirmation points on the snake so it's not you know i'm not just saying that like she's what one a lean false water cobra and two incredibly tame be careful because they're such ready feeders you don't need to go mad just take it steady Yes, they have a relatively fast metabolism, but there's no need to just get crackers with it. it you're only going to foreshorten your snake's life. And that's a serious warning because obesity is a killer. In captivity, this isn't a particularly needy snake. They're, they're, they're absolutely straightforward to raise. The one thing that I would say about them is they seem to shun higher temperatures. They do not like being too warm, which again makes me think that they are these animals originate that we keep in captivity from the southern part of the um, the uh, distribution map because this is in keeping with the climate in that area. Basking opportunities should not exceed 30 degrees Celsius and many keepers have a top end temperature of only 28 degrees Celsius and then allow them to cool down from that. Um, 30 degrees, they may find, you may find that they rarely bask or, or that they go that far up that end. So you do have to be careful and certainly a, a water container that they can cool down in down the cool end would be a welcome escape from this if you were going to go up towards 30 degrees. Care must be taken not to make it too moist. Blistering can occur and this happens in the nature scene snakes as well and seems to be a universal problem with semi-aquatic snakes. People seem to take the, the word semi-aquatic and then think that they can make some boggy, steamy, 
horrible mess of a vivarium where condensation is dripping everywhere. In inevitably, airflow is terrible. And then we get fungal and bacterial flourishes, and this leads to the blistering and the skin problems seen in many semi-aquatic snakes, anacondas included. So we're just going to take it steady. We're not going to um, allow it to become too moist. We're going to make sure that there's really good airflow. You can set up like a terrestrial paludarium with like a, an attached aquarium in that is filtered. You could even put fish in and let it hunt. But it, when it comes out to dry off, it must be allowed to dry off underneath a basking light and be able to have good airflow that stops condensation from forming with such a volume of water being in the enclosure this can be a difficult balance. So actually, it's sometimes easier to just keep these as a standard terrestrial snake with a water bowl that they can take a drink from and just a regular tank that we're gonna spray when they come up to shed their skin. Like your substrate would be orchid bark, which was allowed to be relatively dry most of the time. And when we see the shed cycles coming, we're gonna give them a spray. The great thing is this doesn't seem to be a particularly weak snake either. So we're not gonna be getting any um, pneumonias or colds or oropyrrhea respiratory infections. And those cooler temperatures as well make them hardy. This is a really quite bomb-proof snake. For a semi-aquatic snake, that's rare to say because things like the Xenodon Meramite can be an absolute nightmare to raise and the pseudo Xenodon's even worse. Whereas things like the Hydrodynasties, they're just so straightforward and they've grown massively in popularity over the past three years since we made the last video. And we can't produce enough of them. The demand is that high. I mean, all right, granted, we are doing some color face stuff, but even so, the demand is just really, really amazing. Um, a full grown snake depends on the snake. I mean, realistically, to be fair to the animal, a minimum of a 522, maybe even a 622 as the adult tank. Heating can be relatively rudimentary. You can use a ceramic bulb and this can be strapped to a pulse or dimming thermostat, which is just going to raise the temperature at one side and get us up to that 28 degrees. I would then couple this with a UV light, such as the Shade Dweller bulb, which is from Arcadia, uh, or one of the forest UV lights, which would be towards the ceramic end. The research is now suggesting that we should have um, photo regulation as well as thermo regulation so a lit end and a shady end so this is what we're going to do with the provision of the uv and the ceramic therefore light equals heat because the two are at the same end i don't buy into this there has to be a halogen bulb in there nonsense uh, i i just that's not I, I don't agree with it a ceramic is fine uh, a deep heat projector uh, or a couple of deep heat projectors from arcadia would also be fine be careful because they're not quite as effective at uh, keeping it the air, air warm whereas they're great at warming surfaces so just be careful i'd keep an eye on them and carefully study them um the temperature is, is relatively buoyant throughout the 24 hours we don't need to go during the standard year we're only going to manipulate the temperatures gently for uh, breeding and cycling plenty of cork bark plenty of logs um, a decent sized water bowl but not necessarily for bathing as i said we keep them as a terrestrial snake if you want to keep them semi-aquatic fine but be prepared to do a lot of testing prior to getting your snake to make sure that it all works properly without condensating and becoming ridiculous to look after and make sure uh, that we've got access to the filters and that the filters are capable of processing an eight foot snake's turds because they are substantial after they've eaten their adult rats. Um, breeding happens uh, annually. Uh, we regularly get a second clutch this is without the reintroduction of the male she will just if she's ready will ovulate and have another litter it's her choice we don't really get much choice in it we just try and keep her balanced with her food to make sure her weight stays buoyant um we've had litters of maybe 10 to 17 eggs but the literature states that this could go up to 30 eggs and this is obviously reflective of having the bigger eight or nine foot uh, examples which will have bigger yields and bigger eggs um the females will shed their skin uh prior to egg laying as with all colubrid snakes and we found our female goes between 11 and 14 days uh post uh, egg laying shed a uh, pre-egg laying shed uh before she actually uh drops the eggs and incubation at 28 and a half degrees is around 70 days so a good sort of eight to ten days longer than most corn snakes uh, and these are sizable snakes when they're born 
now we'll cover let's have a look at this is a two-year-old girl that we've been slowly and steadily raising and then this is a brother or sister from this season and this animal has only shed its birth skin it hasn't fed yet so they are quite sizable as babies when they first come out of their parent uh, sorry of the egg and it's you know be careful when you're buying them that if you're buying them at this size you may well just be buying a hatchling so make sure you get feeding records with them to prove that they've been eating but straight out of the egg the babies we produce are wonderful there's no aggression they're fabulous absolutely fabulous i've got to put you back in your box while i finish this video thank you right This snake is rear fanged. It has the potential to deliver quite a potent bite if you are predisposed to react to it. And this can result in really quite serious edema. Uh, this was off a baby hydrodynastes. Local swelling after 25 minutes continued to inflate, caused stiffness of the joints, bled a little more than usual, uh, and obviously the internal bru bruising in the retained fluid. I've been bit by false water cobras on multiple occasions and I just bleed a bit. I don't even swell up. I don't particularly feel any pain from the bite itself. So it is definitely down to the individual. But we can't understate the fact that you could react to it. And I don't know whether you're predisposed. So we've got to put that in there. And whilst I'm talking about the wonderful temperament that these snakes are displaying and the stock that we have and just how wonderfully tame and great they are. There, there are animals that are uh, really quite grumpy and very aggressive. So my suggestion would be to get animals from an early age and work with them regularly. Um, just, I mean, you don't have to get them out every day. This girl probably only comes out once or twice a week, but she just has five minutes and it just keeps her in the loop and she knows who we are and she's not gonna react too badly. So, climate notes. Let's have a look. Right. We have picked four different regions. We've picked the Gran Chaco in Paraguay. We've picked Santa Cruz in Bolivia. We've picked Salta in Argentina and Belo Horizonte in Brazil. We've taken the daytime highs and we've taken the average across the four. Uh, I'm working from January onwards. Obviously, this is the Southern Hemisphere. So their winter is our summer. 30.3, 30, 29, 27, 24, 23, 23, 26, 27, 29, 29 and 30. So we see that represented here with a pretty obvious winter between May and August. Then nighttime lows, 20, 19, 19, 17, 14, 12, 11, 13, 15, 17, 18 and 19. And that parallel for our nighttime lows which maybe just drop off slightly more keenly in winter, taking us down to that sort of 12 to 14 degrees uh, Celsius, which means that there would be, you know, a slowdown, not necessarily a full brumation. There will be surfaces that still reach well in excess of 20 degrees for them to bask upon, but maybe hunting uh, opportunities aren't quite as, as regular and just a general slowing down and it's only for a couple of months and we can mirror that quite easily in captivity to then have a period of no feeding slightly cooler nights slightly cooler days just three i don't know three or four degrees off just a steady decline is enough to trigger the breeding activity and that happens and you'll find that there's a natural attrition to the room temperature that the animals are kept in anyway in winter so this kind of helps you so you might find that they even cycle themselves uh, rainfall so we have a very defined uh, wet season and cool season uh, again from the same regions so these are measurements of millimeters of rainfall per month 73 mil 61 48 29 17 10 5 in fact in Belo Horizonte Brazil there is three months of less than one mil per month rainfall so a very much a drought season and then back up to uh where are we 2.5 11.8 27 48 and 82 so we can see one the seasons for day and night 
and as we hit winter that is also the drought patch for the year so that summer high is where the most moisture is so we could maybe incorporate them drying out in that winter period when we're not feeding them and it starts to cool down you know and that that will also act as a natural trigger there's a lot of variability in false water cobras and you seem to get different colors like the little normal that i showed you which was those lovely chocolate browns and chestnuts this is what we would call a king's phase which was this color when it was born sadly they do golden out and you can see the yellows on the sides are still very pretty but we're starting to get this goldening off now um but even so she's still absolutely wonderful from our uh, pair that we breed each season we get the normals we get the hypos we get these wonderful red hypos and then we get the king's phase um king's phase is one that we we found out was called that by a guy called rick pellin who had previously been breeding them and uh i mean to me they just look like a super hypo but because the color isn't retained brilliantly there's something going on you need to have one of these snakes to produce those colors um but as for the long-term coloration that they, they do they do uh, uh brown and golden off they're still prettier than a standard falsy but you know they're not uh they're not as bright as they were when they were born and this season excitingly we've produced some high orange ones which are absolutely amazing and then there's things like lavenders and stuff that people are working with and there is the us hypo which is unrelated to the uk hypo it's all kind of up in the air um, but they are simply wonderful snakes um, that are a great next step species. This is a lot of snake. They can be reasonably boisterous. They have great appetites. They're strong and they can be quite intimidating. They're willing to hood readily. Now, they hood the same way that a rat snake might rattle its tail. Now, a rattle of its tail means, oh, I've just noticed you here and you've, you, you've scared me a bit. It doesn't mean that it's a precursor to being bit. If a false water uh, cobra hood, thank you, nice. Is there really a need? Listen to that. This is, these are the only species of snake that I know that fart, like proper bum clapping trumps. It's disgusting, man. What are you doing to me? In the middle of a video, what are you like? Never work with children or animals, eh? What was that all about? That was unnecessary, wasn't it? A false water cobra will hood the same way that the rat snake rattles its tail. It isn't a precursor to being bit, but it's very good at pointing people off. People associate that hood with being bit, and obviously the venomous cobras. Um, and really, that apprehension is, is uh, you know, it's... Sometimes, quite often it's unfounded. You're gonna have a perfectly tame snake once it's removed from its enclosure and it's allowed to calm down. Um, and as you can see, I mean, the compliance level on this snake is just perfect. Even if you are trumping and weighing, you horrible animal, eh? Do your research. Obviously we'll try and make these available for you as well. Fantastic, fantastic snakes. But you could react to them if bitten. Bear that in mind and you're going to need a lot of space for one of them when they're fully mature these are large snakes i hope you enjoyed the video i hope it was improvement on the first one and you got a lot more from it information wise we'll see you again soon and we'll try not to leave it three months this time cheers guys bye